Our next talk is by Victoria Chen and uh, Shin Fukuda. Uh, the title is When Philippine Type Voice Meets Indo European Style Voice Insights from Puyuma. Thanks, Mitchell. Um, okay, so um, the core question we'll be investigating today is Is Philippine Type Voice similar to Indo European Style Voice? Um, so under the voice of the division, um, in the European style voice has been accounted for through the postulation of different flavors of voice. And Philippine type voice has long been considered to possess a similar system. And under both well-adopted approaches, Philippine type voice is similar to in the European style voice and being some kind of valency indicating morphology hosted within um, the core verbal domain. Um, but in this talk, we'll be proposing an alternative drawing on evidence from an understudied Western Asian language where both type of voice morphology can co-occur in the same clause. And we'll be showing that um, this language provides some novel evidence that um, in the European type voice uh, constitute valency indicating morphology hosted within voice P, Whereas Philippine type voice might be best analyzed as topic indicating morphology um, hosted in the C domain. Okay, so in what follows, I'll first provide an overview of how these two type of voice systems interwine in Puyuma, and we will look more into um, a passive like construction in this language. Okay, so Puyuma is an understudied and severely endangered Formosan language spoken in southeastern Taiwan. Um, it comprises a single member primary branch of the Yashinesian family and possesses a prototypical Philippine type um, for a voice system similar to Tagalog and Malagasy. So as is well known, um, voice morphology on the verb controls the distribution of a special marker, which I label as pivot here, um, which indicate the sole phrase of the clause eligible for a bar extraction. Um, this is known as the pivot only extraction constraint that you're all familiar with. Um, so on top of this uh, four-way voice system, Puyuma displays a two-way voice alternation um, similar to the in the European style active passive alternation. Um, so as you can see in 2A, um, when the bivalent verb bears Philippine type active voice morphology as in 2A, um, both the external argument and the internal argument are obligatorily, obligatorily present. Um, but with an additional affix u, as in, as in 2b, the external argument must be absent. And the internal argument bears pivot marking similar to an accusative subject, um, as in 3. And notice that flippant type active voice morphology is present in both 2a, 2b, and 3. And we'll revisit this in section 5. Okay, so now we'll look a little bit more into this um, passive-like construction and show that it might um, actually represent a pretty rare type of detransitive construction um, that's different from all common types of derived intransitives. Okay, so um, despite its similarities with passives, this construction doesn't fit well with the passive analysis, first because of its incompati um, incompatibility with um, agent denoting PPs, namely five phrases, um, seen in example four and five. And also it's incompatible with agent-oriented adverbs, as you can see in seven and eight. So um, 7b and 8b shows that the active counterpart of this U construction are free to combine with agent denoting um, agent oriented adverbs such as secretly or rigorously, uh, but that's not possible with this UMART constructions. So uh, this shows that it's pretty different from a passive. Um, so this construction also doesn't work well with an impersonal analysis, um, as impersonals are characterized by an exitive subject and an internal argument um, remaining in object marking. And this is clearly different from the U construction, which requires uh, an internal argument in normal subject marking similar to the subject in monovalent intransitives, um, as in 10B. Okay, so uh, this construction also doesn't fit well with the middle analysis, as middles are usually uh, lacking a specific time reference and denote generic interpretation. Uh, whereas this U construction is usually episodic um, with past tense reference without perfective morphology. Um, and finally, it's also quite different from an anti-causative, 
as any causative across linkages are not compatible with agent-oriented verbs, such as um, curve, catch, cheat, or collect, uh, whereas the wool construction is free to combine with this kind of um, agent-oriented verbs. Um, so a quick interim summary, um, this affix u in Puyuma marks a pretty rare type of derived intransitive, which doesn't allow an external argument to be synthetically realized, and it's usually episodic, is, in, is compatible with verbs with agent-oriented semantics, and it doesn't allow in personal interpretation. Okay, um, and now we're ready to look more into the locus of this passive-like morphing in Puyuma. And here we'll be assuming a tripartite division of verb phrase structure, um, assuming that voice is the locus of active versus passive voice, and it's responsible for introducing the external argument and um, licensing accusative case. And the will be responsible for verbalizing the root, encoding event type, and introducing causative um, semantics. And the lexical verb responsible for we're introducing and theta licensing um, the internal argument. And we'll further assume um, the mirror principle whereby um, morphological derivations should directly reflect synthetic derivations. Okay, so empirically, we have seen that U is the typical valency decreasing morphing um, whose presence and absence correlate with that of the external argument. So we propose accordingly that it might be the morphological reflex of the defective voice head, which is independent of the little v and above little v. And we assume this head is incapable of introducing an EA and case licensing an, an IA, which is why this construction can't contain an external argument and lacks object case marking. And the internal argument must be the case available to an accusative subject, as you can see in 12b. And we further assume the active counterpart of the U construction, as in 13, is um, a construction that bears an unmarked active voice, um, which is capable of um, external argument introducing and licensing the internal argument. And this is pretty common across the languages that active voice is um, morphologically unmarked. Okay, so if this proposal is on the right track, we expect to see evidence that U is um, hosted below aspect and above little v um, as an independent functional head. And I'll be presenting some evidence for this um, prediction. Okay, so um, the first piece of evidence for U as hosted above little v comes from linear ordering. So as you can see in 16, which has two sentences with um, as a detransitivized causatives. As you can see here, the causer is obligatory absent, and this U morphine obligatory surfaces to the left of causative morphology. So this, at the same time, provides novel evidence for voice and little v as two distinct functional heads, and also that the former is in charge of introducing the external argument and the latter for introducing event types. Um, and importantly, the fact that the linear ordering of U, the causative affix, and the lexical verb serves in the way you see in 16 uh, follows directly from the prediction of the mirror principle, uh, whereby we expect to see the reflex of voice to surface to the left of reflex of little v and that of the um, lexical verb. Okay. Um, a second piece of evidence for U as the reflex of voice come from restructuring infinitives. Um, so as you can see in 18, while causative morphology is free to appear in restructuring infinitive in Puyuma, U cannot. Um, so under the deficient size of restructuring infinitive, the deficient size account of the restructuring infinitives, this is kind of expected um, if U is the spell out of voice. Uh, which is assumed to be lacking in restructuring environment. Okay, so uh, moving on to U, evidence for U as hosted below aspect. Um, so that evidence come from Puma's irrealist verb form. Um, so in this language, uh, irrealist morphology has two forms. Uh, when attached to a vowel initial stem, um, as in 19a, uh, the irrealist morphology must surface as an infix R, uh, but when attached to consonant initial basis, um, it was surfaced as a syllable, 
uh, in the form of CA regurgitation, namely coupling the onset of the root plus the insertion of the vowel R. Okay. Um, so the fact that O oh, the U marked forms in Puyuma obligatory, obligatory take the infix A in their irrealis verb form suggests that U plus the verb is treated as a vowel initial stem. Um, so this suggests that U is encoded into morphology before the insertion of aspect morphology, um, such as irrealis. So assuming the mirror principle holds, this suggests that U is hosted in a projection below aspect head. Okay, so an interesting summary, we have seen evidence that U is hosted above little v, but below aspect. And as a given that it's uh, presence or absence is linked tightly to the presence or absence of an external argument, uh, we assume that it is the morphological spell out of a defective voice. Okay, so we're now ready to look more into the locus of Philippine type voice morphology in this language. Okay, so recall that in the D-trans device causative examples uh, repeated here in 21, uh, recall that active voice morphology surfaces to the left of U and causative morphology. So under our analysis that U is the spell out of voice, this linear ordering indicate that active voice morphology might be hosted in a projection that's higher than voice and probably outside of the core verbal projections. So evidence for AV as further hosted above aspect P comes again from um, Puyuma's verb forms. So in Puyuma, uh, when a progressive verb bears active voice morphology, this morphing and this infix um is obligatory inserted into progressive morphology, uh, which has the form of CA rigidification, which is the green marked syllable in 22b. So, and it can't insert it into the stem, sorry, um, as you can see in 22b. So the only option is for AV to insert into this um, progressive morphology. So this suggests that AV is encoded in the morphology after that of aspect, uh, revealing that it might be hosted in a projection that's higher than aspect. And as Puyuma is a tenseless language, so are many other Western Indonesian languages, this suggests that AV might be hosted in the C domain. Okay. So evidence for AV as hosted at, in the C domain come from the fact that it inflects for mood in Puyuma. Um, and in some other morphosyntactically conservative um, Philippine type languages. And as mood is standardly assumed to be encoded in the C domain, this then further support for AV as encoded in the stem area. And this is in line with a families of previous A bar agreement approaches to Philippine type voice, which assume that Philippine type voice is some kind of topic indicating or um, WH agreement morphology hosted in C. Um, and uh, a consensus among several previous approaches was that um, actor voice morphology is associated with a nominative or subject topic. Um, and this is um, supported by Puyuma internal evidence. So um, in Puyuma, a discourse topic must be pivot marked, um, which is consistent with the topic analysis for pivot. Um, so as you can see in this question answer sequence, so if you ask what did Pillai do today with a clear discourse topic, which is the Pillai. So if the answer to this question has a subject discourse topic, as in she cooked the rice bowls, then it's obligatory that the, the discourse topic must be placed in pivot form with the use of actor voice morphology. And an alternative answer with patient voice and non um, non pivot discourse topic is considered unacceptable or like a second language speaker. So uh, this suggests a tight connection between AV morphology and a subject slash normative topic. Okay, so uh, we have seen pretty strong evidence from this language that um, AV morphology might be hosted high in a tree, whereas it has separate morphology to indicate voice. So now it might be a good, um, a good time to reconsider some previous approach to 
uh, phototype voice, which assume phototype voice is hosted within the core variable projection associated with some kind of voice head or applicative head. Okay, so if if the evidence from Puyuma is com and is is useful, we expect to see some kind of potential inconsistencies in the approaches that assume voice morphology is hosted in voice. So one well adopted approach to flippant type actor voice was that it is the spell out of intransitive voice. Um, and an important assumption associated with this claim is that two place actor voice constructions like um, 22A, uh, 28 is an anti passive with an oblique object. Um, so now the fact that this putative anti passive is compatible with um, external argument detransitivization as in 29 um, sort of raised further question of the anti passive analysis as derived intransitives such as antipassives are cross-linguistically incompatible with further latency decreasing operations such as um, external argument detransitization encoded by this U morphing. Um, another potential question is the fact that actor voice morphology appears on an accusative in Puma. So given that an accusative naturally lack an external argument, we have two options to analyze this structure. One option is that this an accusative lacks a voice layer. And if that is the case, we expect to see the absence of actor voice morphology if actor voice marks intransitive voice. Um, an alternative approach is to assume this an accusative um, possesses a defective voice head, which is why it can um, introduce an external argument. Um, but if this approach is on the right track, we assume to see the presence of the affix u in Puyuma, um, as we have seen pretty strong evidence that u is the spill out of a defective voice. Um, further question to this uh, traditional approach is that the transitive counterpart of the unaccusative we have seen also bears actor voice morphology, um, as seen in 31. So this raises further question to the treatment that uh, the treatment of actor AV and PV as um, transitivity indicating morphology hosted in voice. Okay, so a final question in this story is about the LV and CV morphology. So if they're consistent with AV and PV morphology, we might expect them to be also hosted in the C domain. Um, but a well-adopted approach, as uh, many of you must be familiar with, is to treat them as applicative markers. So uh, looking into evidence in Puyuma, we see that LVCV morphings similar to AV and PV infect for mood, um, as you can see in this paradigm. So as mood is standardly assumed to be encoded in the C domain, this raise further job of analyzing them as applicative affixes. Um, another piece of evidence comes from the fact that they do behave like agreement morphology. So in Puyuma, LVCV affixes obligatory climb to the highest predicate, um, even if that predicate is an adverb. And this is thing in 36. So I gave the child the flowers versus I secretly gave the child the flowers. So with the presence of this adverb secretly, uh, you can say that LV morphology must climb to this adverb. Um, with the same pivot placement. And the same observation 10 from CV, cost, um, CV clauses. Um, and one uh, final observation concerning about the applicative approach to LVCV constructions is bind in fact. So if the applicative analysis is on the right track, we expect to see all pivot marked phrase in circumstantial constructions and CV constructions to be licensed as um, an internal argument in the highest internal argument position. Uh, but as seen in 30, 33A and B, a CV marked ditransitive in Biuma has a non pivot recipient that um, asymmetrically bind into a pivot marked thing um, as in um, what you can say in 30A at 33A and an attempt to have this pivot to bind into the non-pivot mark recipient um, is not possible. 
So this point to a double object construction structure of the CV diatrins that we have seen, indicating that this pivot is bound by a recipient uh, rather than being licensed in the highest internal argument position as an applied object. So a quick summary, uh, it looks like uh, as far as Puma is concerned, it looks like it's uh, flippant type voice morphology doesn't really realize a, a functional head that's hosted within the core verbal projection. Um, so a quick conclusion, um, drawing on evidence from this language, uh, it looks like flippant type voice is fundamentally different from voice in the traditional sense. Um, which constitute valency indicating morphology hosted in voice P. And we've also seen some evidence that, um, at least in Puyuma, these uh, voice alternations might be better analyzed as topic indicating morphology hosted in the C domain, and which is why these two types of voice morphology are compatible within the same clause um, in this language. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, we have uh, exactly 10 minutes for questions. If, uh, if you have a question, um, please uh, indicate so in the chat or um, otherwise, and I will call on you. Um, uh, let's go with Edith. Hi, Edith. Hi, Victoria. Nice to hear your voice. Um, so. Um, and nice talk. I thought it was very clear. But I've always had one question that has never been answered for me by the voice as some kind of agreement people is, why do we have the affixes bearing absolutely no resemblance to each other and occurring in very different very different places on the host verb. We don't, we don't expect that. We expect the voice affixes to be either all prefixal or all suffixal right. or all prefixal. So, so what are your thoughts on that? To be honest, I have no answer to that question. And I think it's really mysterious. And so you're, you're saying that why AV is usually an infix, but um, PVLV and CVs are suffixes which seems to suggest something, but in terms of the agreement approaches, there is no explanation to that. Yeah, is that, is that the main, your main question? And yes, conjugation, they, yeah. Yeah, that was my question. Yeah, I so. have no answer to that. I don't really know. Yeah. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, let's, uh, Let's go to uh, Mike, Mike Berry. Hello. I cannot. Hi, Mike. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, this looked great. I just have one quick question about uh, the, um, uh, where you use the restructuring data. Uh, the example was try, uh, right. which sort of presupposes some kind of agentivity on the embedded, uh, uh, right. presupposes an, an agentive embedded subject, right. which of course right. there isn't one. Um, I'm wondering if there's some other way to get around that. Um, I know it's difficult because control predicates typically are agentive in some kind of way. Um, uh, if you can show that you can use an intransit, um, if you can embed um, an intransitive with low agentivity, like an unaccusative, right. under try, and if that's grammatical, at least that right. would sort of mitigate um, uh, mm. the problem. Um, mm. Like, uh, I don't know, these are always hard to come up with, like um, the mm. actor tried to die tragically mm. or something, you know, like on stage or something like that? Yeah, that's a great question. And so, yeah, and I was kind of worried about using this as a diagnostics as I, I kind of, I totally agree with your concern. But what I can say here is that uh, Julie Legate uh, provided very similar data in Achenese. And I think in Achenese, you can have this kind of um, passivized um, they pacifies in, in a restructuring infinitive with the presence of a voice head there. Mm -hmm. um, in that Chinese, it surfaces as agreement morphology. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems to suggest the semantics 
itself is okay to have a voice head present even with agent semantics. But um, uh, so of course that's that's based on evidence from that language, and it's still possible that the fact that this is not good in Puma is because in this language that kind of semantic combination is not great. Yeah. Um, as for using a more an accusative verb in this environment, that would be a little bit difficult because you usually don't detrans device. You know. Well, an, an no. What I mean is, if you just not detransitivize it, but just um, uh, have uh, an unaccusative in the uh, embedded clause. So, That's totally fine. Without the u morphing, it's totally fine to have, I think, an accusatives. Right. right. Well, that okay. would tell you. That right. would tell you that the problem uh, uh, with um, uh, with the that would tell you that the problem in eighteen is not due to the semantics. Then, or at least would suggest Ooh. that the problem is not right. due to the That's semantics, yeah. but due to uh, what you're trying to say here. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And yeah. I I do think it's possible to have an an accusative verb inside an infrastructure infinitive without u. So I misunderstood your question. Well, Good. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks. Hiroki has a sort of related question, I think. Sure. Yeah. Um. So I might have missed this. Uh. But um. My question is, uh, is u this u morphine? compatible only with AV or is it also okay with the other voices? Oh, that's an excellent question. So, so the short answer is it is compatible only with AV, LV and CV, mm. but not with PV, uh, which is expected because PV usually denotes some kind of object pivot, which we assume to be, we expect to be absent here because mm -hmm. this construction is intransitive. So it shouldn't have any object, which is why patient voice is not compatible. Right. But it's totally fine to have a U marked construction mark in locative voice or circumstantial voice, such okay. as uh, somebody was cheated with. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, like the the uh, the stone the stone was buried with some kind of instrument. Um, and in circumstantial voice, that's totally possible in Puyuma. Yeah, thanks. Um, we have a question from Zach. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, thank you for your talk. I'm really interested in this topic. Um, and I thought it was really creative to use the assumptions of the mirror principle with the different facts about the morphology. And I think something uh, maybe I missed it, that I just had a question about is how do you um, relate the arguments that you presented for the position of U to where you locate the um, voice morphology in the syntactic structure? Would you say that the voice morphology is in C? Um, and if so, then what about in a case where there's like an overt complementizer or something? So you're asking, um, to clarify, you're asking how we see a voice indicating affix in Puyuma means for the locus of footprint type voice. Is that your right, question? Right. Yeah. So you basically, that in C? right, right, right. So uh, the first response is that because in, in the traditional sense, uh, there is this pretty well adopted thought that uh, flippant type AV and PV affixes are similar to this U in being, you know, latency indicating morphology hosted in voice. So the fact that we now see a, a very good candidate of voice, the affix for that head, that co-occurs with flippant type voice morphology sort of reminds us to re-examine the status of flippant type voice. Um, and drawing on this data in Puyuma, that which we see the reflex of voice surfaces to the right of actor voice morphology, for example, sort of suggests that AV is hosted higher in the tree. Uh, but the fact that it is probably located in the C domain is based on some other pieces of evidence. Um, for example, it seems to be inserted after aspect morphology and effect, effects for mood 
and also what's the other evidence they're talking about. I think basically uh, is these two, two pieces of evidence. And another thing is that it does seem to be tightly associated with topichood. Um, as for AV is concerned, it's associated with the use of a subject or um, normative topic, which sort of reinforces that it's some kind of um, topic indicating morphology, which is usually, you know, hosted in that area in C. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Matt, do you have a short question? Um, yeah, I'll try and keep it short. Uh, so um, I like this story very much. Uh, that won't surprise you to hear. Um, but uh, it raises an interesting puzzle, which is um, why uh, if, uh, you know, you've got convincing evidence, I think, that, that Philippine type voice and, and this valency type voice are, are distinct. But that raises the obvious question of why don't we get the Indo-European type voice more often in Austronesian languages. So why don't we find it in languages in the Philippines? Why don't we find it in Malagasy? Or, or maybe it's there, but we haven't looked for it hard enough, or we haven't looked for it in the right way. Do you have any sort of speculative thoughts on why this, why the sort of clear cut evidence for these two types of voice um, yeah. is so uncommon? I love that question. Um, what I can say is that actually this affix U is reconstructable to proto austronesian So it's also attested in a number of other Formosan, certain type Formosan languages, but it's really understudied. And I have a two appear paper in Oceanic Linguistics that talks about how many certain type languages have this U affix. And I think um, some Formosan languages have other kind of um, valency indicating affixes that looks like a passive. So as I think in terms of um, fluent type languages spoken in Taiwan, we do see the co-occurrence of fluent type voice and Indo-European style voice. But you're uh -huh. right to point out that in the Philippines, these affixes disappears. And I, I but I think in Cebuano, somebody talks about a passive like morphing in that language, which is different from um, fluent type voice. But I think you, you're right that outside Taiwan, this kind of Indo-European style voice affixes are not really productive. And I have no answer to why. Or, or, a, or at least they don't, they don't co-occur with Philippine right. type voice. Right. Yeah. Okay, and thanks. I'll, I'll have yeah, a look at some of that data maybe. <laughs> <laughs>